talking to book people about books and other stuff. Hello and welcome to another episode of Talking to Book People About Books and Other Stuff in which I am going to chat to the novelist Yuri Herrera. I say novelist, actually his latest book The Silent Fury is not a novel at all but an incredible expose of um, a mining uh, accident and cover-up that took place in Mexico over a hundred years ago. Um, it's a very dramatic and, and, and brilliant short book. Um, Yuri is a, a big favourite author of ours. He's written novels such as Signs Preceding the Edge of the End of the World and Transmigration of Bodies, both of which we absolutely adore. So we'll talk to him about them as well and about lockdown and about writing and about reading and about politics. I'm about to magically move to the Imaginarium in Mr. B's where we, Yuri and I had our chat, at least that's why, where I had my chat, Yuri was in New Orleans. So uh, without further ado, let me flick across and uh, we'll begin talking with Yuri Herrera. Yuri, thanks so much for spending time having a chat with us. Thrilled to be talking to you from here in Bath and from the, from our kind of now slowly reopening shop. And you're down there in New Orleans. Is that where you've been for the whole time? Have you have you been based there throughout this? Is that where you're based nowadays? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for having me again, this time uh, virtually. I remember <laughs> being there a couple of years ago, maybe a little bit more. How how has it been just being there? How has the community handled it over this whole time? Has it has it been a the people been compliant? Has there been a kind of solidarity, or or is it a bit of a mixed bag? I would say a really mixed bag. Uh, it has been really really strange in that sense. For the first time in decades, the bars were closed. Because you know, New Orleans is a place that has where the bars have no closing time, right. and there were bars that actually didn't even close during Katrina. Right. There are bars that have been open for decades. Right. And this was the first time in decades that every single bar closed. So it was a big hit to the city. Um. So you you saw several organizations doing interesting things like uh, taking taking food to the people who were out of out of job taking food to older people taking food to the, to the many many migrant workers that are not receiving any support from the from the government yeah. while at the same time they keep working you know yeah um, so it's been it's been a, a, a mixed bag it's uh, it was getting better after being really bad around april yeah. And now, apparently, it's getting bad again. Um, and I think it's going to be like this in the whole world for a while. And how about you? Have you, have you, been, have you read well over this time? Or has, has the sort of fog of all of this affected your reading during the last few months? Oh, I have been reading a lot. Right now, I'm rereading one great, huge novel called Palinuro de Mexico. It has been translated in, into English, but I don't know the title in English. That the author is Fernando del Paso. It's a 500-page novel that was what it was called in the 70s, uh, especially uh, Novela Total, the total novel, in which right. it was like a, this kind of of enterprise to create its own language, its own sense of time, its own sense of history. So these are really, really demanding novels that not, pretty much nobody reads, even though they, some of them are great. Uh -huh. And I am also reading some short stories that I have been postponing by Yasunari Kawabata, you know, the, uh -huh. the Japanese Nobel Prize. Yeah, I, always, I always have um, a thriller or a, a noir or a detective novel by my bed, yeah. which is what I read before trying to sleep. Maybe uh -huh. that, that's one reason why I don't sleep very well. <laughs> because another thing that I have been trying to do is to read more noirs written by women. Yeah. And this is uh, an Irish, Irish writer. This the Bur The Burning by Jane Casey. It has been really interesting for me to to get more in touch which with the way women talk about crime right which is was also very interesting to me when i started reading for instance black writers uh, yeah. uh, talking about crime because it's yeah. a different 
it's a different relationship uh, depending what population is, is writing about crime. If, it, if it's uh, uh, Latin American people or women or black people have a very different relationship with the idea of order and yeah. with the police. And, you know. Right, right. I think that's, that's interesting. And I mean, obviously with the, um, the Black Lives Matter campaign has affected, has translated into interest in books uh, in, in a way that I cannot remember happening with any other macro political social movement. How long may it continue? Well, it was uh, long past due, so I, th oh. I think Ray, there are there are things that are, that that uh, there are certain changes that seem to happen in a relatively fast fast uh, way. It's, it is a scandalous. It is it is absolutely at some in uh, it, it is it is a, a crime committed yeah. by the state. It is terrorism in, in at some point, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's something that the the way black people have to wait had to wait for a long, long, long time until yeah. there was this kind of reckoning, global reckoning about what yeah. has been done to them. I think that uh, migrants have to, uh, still have to wait a little bit more. And is I mean, why why do you, I don't know why do you think that is? I mean, what why has it? Why has that moment not come? I mean, and are, do you think there's any hope when you look at things like the Me Too movement, then the Black Lives Matter movement? Do you think there's a sense, and maybe it's because of Generation Z, as they're called, uh, uh, you know, holding people to account a little bit more, maybe? Do you think these moments are coming more quickly now? Is there a general hope that that could be the case? I don't know. Maybe. Because... I, I don't know. I have the feeling that with the, with the pandemic, and the recession and uh, the um, exhaustion of, of certain economic and political um, political systems that we are in the verge of of a, of a, of a big change, a big cultural change, a big a big change in, in, in the way we understand work, the way we understand relationships, the, w the way we understand uh, things that we thought were natural, even even how we travel, even how we consume uh, yeah. our, our food. So I think m many things are, are going to change. Um, I'm not sure why some of them are already being more why some changes are more visible than, than other ones. Um, because sometimes you have just one, one small event that triggers the yeah. whole thing, like what happened with George Floyd. It's not that this, this was the first time that something like no. this happened, but, this, but there was something here that triggered the, uh, yeah. the, uh, the whole thing, you know? Uh, as in with the Me Too movement, it, it's not like before that. <laughs> the women didn't need to 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 announce it. It was just something about the Harvey Weinstein case yeah, yeah. that created a certain a, a certain uh, uh, sensibility. Uh, I just hope that the the demands of many other populations that have that are dispossessed don't get don't get lost in yeah. this huge wave of change. You know, no. that's coming. No, I, I think that's right. And I think it is those personalized moments do seem to make all the difference. I mean, and we've seen a lot of writing around the, particularly around the issue of um, migration and everything that goes on, everything that you just alluded to that's terrible around the uh, the Mexican-American border, especially, you know, we've seen, we've seen that represented in literature, you know, an enormous amount in the in recent years much more than it was you know beforehand and certainly we've seen we see here even in the uk people you know reaching to try and understand exactly what goes on and the way that uh, migrants are oppressed and and uh, and very ill treated around the border so i do hope that it's you know not far away the moment where the moment where you know, proper attention gets gets shine, shone on it. Of course, it also depends with, you know, the man at the top doesn't help, of course. I, I wanted to go from there. It doesn't feel like too big a leap to talk a little bit about the silent fury and when uh, when 
stories get uh, get twisted and, and 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 covered up and what have you. Can you can you tell us? You know, the book just came out. Uh, I'm really glad to say that it came out and wasn't you know unduly delayed by by the pandemic and it's out on our shelves right now and and i was just talking with my colleague tom who's always been a big champion at this end of, of your writing and he managed to read it even before lockdown he read a, an early copy that and other story centers here can you tell us a little bit of, about it tell me a little bit about it for those uh, of our viewers who haven't seen it yet and tell us tell me how you came across this story of this uh the El Bordo mine fire. Well, this is a story that I have heard uh, in Pachuca, in my hometown, for a long, long time. And uh, but I, I heard uh, more consistently about it from my brother Tonatiu, which is uh, also which is a, a historian. He he's like a polymath. He does a lot of stuff, but among the things he does, he's a historian. And when I was doing my PhD in Berkeley. I decided that I wanted to do my dissertation about this story instead of getting an author or a genre or a period and study that. Um, that was a, a possibility that really bored me, that really didn't right. excite me. I wanted to, to, do, to research something that was important to me personally and that I thought that could be important to other people. Yeah. So um, I knew about this. But I didn't know uh, how many sources were talking about it, how many traces were about it. So that was my research to find the, 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 the traces, the, the, um, the physical traces of this, of this story and to analyze them, to criticize them and to, in that way, to criticize the official version of this story. So the story, for the people who don't know about it, is this. In 1920, in March 10th, 1920, there was a fire in a mine in, in the outskirts of Pachuca. Pachuca is, used to be a mining town one hour north of Mexico City. At some point, it was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, producer of silver in the world in the, in the 18th century. Um, but the, mo the mines, most of them are exhausted now. Anyway, at the beginning of the 20th century, this mine was, um, uh, was being administered by an American company. And on this day, there was a fire. And the administrators, who were American, decided to close off the mines to stop the, the oxygen from, uh, for, from feeding the fire. The, the thing is that they did this when they were still uh, dozens of miners inside the mine. So basically they, they, they killed it. The, um, their justification was that it was impossible that the miners were alive because of the gases that, that uh, would have been down there. But the thing is, uh, six days later when they opened the mine, they found that there were seven miners still alive, which means that very likely there were a lot more miners um, alive when, at, at the moment when they, when they closed off the mines. So there was an investigation, but the investigation was not about the possible responsibility of the administrators of the mine in the deaths of the miners, but was just about technical thing, about where the fire started. And the thing is the investigation didn't even solve this. So the investigation was just a way to create a credible lie, a legal lie, a legal truth. So this is what I was trying to, to do, to, to, to confront this, this version with its own contradictions, with its own silences. Yeah. Um, well, first I did it as, as, as a dissertation which was a very important uh, step for me because it, it makes you to read critically. It, it makes you to be really, uh, to, to look deeper at your sources, to, 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 look, uh, to, to, to stress certain areas, to, um, to not look uh, really, uh, superficially. But the thing is, this was a PhD dissertation. And, and it was 
just uh, this this analysis kind of fragmented and uh, interspersed with three with theory. And right. what I wanted to do was to offer a different product of that research, to turn that research into a narrative, an organic narrative that could be read by the people in my hometown, because a lot of people know about this story, but a lot of people don't know about it. Mostly the people who know is the people who had ancestors in the mines. And I wanted to offer a, a consistent version of this, even even if I was acknowledging the gaps and the silences in this. Right. So that's what I try to do, to tell the story from beginning to end in a, in, in a fluid pace so yeah. that someone could, could make sense narrat narratively of it and at some points making a stop to, to acknowledge this, this, the problems that, that I faced and acknowledging that these problems are part of the of the story you know? yeah and and so that must have been an was that a very different writing process to your normal process because you were revisiting something that you had written some time earlier and and i mean obviously you know the the books uh, the majority of the books that you're writing that's been translated over here is is fiction for starters um so there's that but also this idea of going back to something that had been written before and and, and yeah yeah it, it, it's very different uh, for different reasons one is that i am constrained by the sources yeah uh, uh two isn't that i'm constrained not only but the by the sources but by the language of the sources right because because the, the the language is not something that yet just uh, that you you can just pick any any other lexicon to talk uh, to talk about it, but you have to to reflect on the responsibility of, of of picking one word over the other. Um, so it was, and also it was. Uh, a different process in terms of me not deciding what sounds better or what makes uh, or, or what uh, is um, more amusing for me which is a way that, that in which I sometimes I make decisions when I'm writing a fiction or or how I'm I am investigating something yeah. linguistically but in this sense the decisions had to do with what was more credible, what was more li more likely, uh, yeah. when you are making this 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 uh, when you're weighing weighing the the sources, you know. Yeah. So trying to be responsible regarding that, and at the same time, trying to to acknowledge that. I am intervening in this. It's not that it, this is an absolutely objective no. form of writing, no, no. which I don't think exists. The moment when you pick a, a topic, when you choose the sources, yeah. you are intervening. In yeah. the same way, the photographer, when it's when the photographer is framing something, yeah. it's intervening. In yeah, you're shining a light on it, right? I mean, you're shining a light on aspects of this that you know. That yes. people should know about and understand them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in that sense, it was it was uh, it was different, and and it was similar in the way that I, what I think one of the thing the things fiction does is not so much to uncover parts of reality, but to underline certain parts of reality that we walk by every day. And that we just just don't pay enough attention, and um, and in that sense, I was trying to underline uh, the importance of the silences in this story, and how the people that were that were uh, that suffered violence in this story, the mm -hmm. miners. The, the dead miners and the, and the miners that survived and their families 
and the whole population of the city that wa that, uh, that that suffered this are in the judicial file they only appear as functions of this official truth yeah so i tried not to not to be hostage of that official truth but to to listen to to this other protagonist even with all the limitations that the sources are, are imposing on me yeah and listen i mean this is presumably as you said it was a very well-known story in uh is it pachuca am i how do you yes. say it? Yeah. uh it was a very well-known story obviously it's a form crucial and terrible day in the in the history of the town but how how has your uh, rendition of it been received has it been uh, because i presume well, even that we're only just seeing the translation i presume there's been a, a, a it came out in its in 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 spanish many you know many months years ago yeah. the first thing that i have to say is that uh, this story is there it's that it's important not because of me it's important because there are uh, two or three generations that have kept kept it alive yeah the miners that were that survived that day and their children and their grandchildren and many people that have been remembering this so my voice is one of these many voices yeah so um but um many people took this opportunity uh, to start uh, organizing and the people of the El Bordo community, which El Bordo is this area yeah. in the outskirts of Pachuca where the mine uh, was, yeah. they started uh, organizing and uh, with the assistance of, of, of different organizations, uh, a cultural center, a small cultural center was created right by the the mass grave where the where the miners were were forgotten apparently you know so actually i had the opportunity right before the quarantine started yeah to be there on yeah. the 100 year anniversary yeah. of the fire yeah. on march 10th of this year yeah. and um well the the community made enough enough noise so that the the mayor of the city and actually the governor yeah. came came in came there and actually supported the, the creation of this of this cultural center yeah and well many people have been has been involved and uh, i uh, i i plan to to keep going back there to 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 give uh, workshops for instance right also the, the the people in the community are planning to to put a, a plaque in the place where was the mass grave which right. was one of the several promises that the mining company made and right. that they didn't they never um, fulfill right. yeah they never did it they were supposed to put a plaque remembering all the people that died that day that didn't happen so maybe it will happen a hundred years later yeah, and because the, the community has been organizing, and as as I said, the community has their own memory. Yeah. But also, I think in some way the book has been has helped to to give yeah. a a, um, a consistent organic yeah. uh, version of the events. So for me, that was the 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 very first objective yeah. to intervene in 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 our, our collective memory in the city so it was a, a big big surprise for me when the book started started being ready in other places in other places in mexico yeah. and in other places in in the english speaking world thanks to the the great translation of, of lisa dillman and the great editing process that and other stories my, my publishing house uh did so yeah. So I am really great. I am really happy about it uh, yeah. because also one thing we started talking about this this topic. You were saying I hope this is not a, a big leap. It, it is not a big leap because yeah. even though I'm talking about something that happened that happened 100 years ago, yeah. for me this is a research about something. It's an investigation about something that is happening in our times. 
you know, the impunity that has plagued Mexico is not something that was invented by uh, this uh, fucking criminal that we had as a, a president, Felipe Calderón. He perfected it, but he didn't invent impunity. Impunity is a system. It's a colonial system that yeah. creates different, different classes of citizens. First class citizens and second class citizens and, and lives who are important and la lives that are dispensable. And um, so this story for me is part of the genealogy of our impunity, you know? Right. So when I'm researching about this and when I'm talking about this, I'm also researching and talking about our present day situation. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, and I think that's why it's so, I think that's why it's eminently possible that it can be read by anyone anywhere as well, because it, it helps us understand that and, uh, and it helps us think about things that are going on in various parts of the world, you know, where, where, where sort of similar situations occur, albeit different in the detail. And it must be very rewarding to have been part of amplifying that story, you know, when you talk about the local cultural center and the hope of putting a some kind of monument there it, that that yeah it must be that must be a rewarding element of it how, how about your other your other writing whatever you're writing right now how have you found writing during the the pandemic have you had more time for that were well, you yeah. were you in the midst of something or was there something new on the horizon while i was finishing a silent fury i was on the side writing um science fiction short stories. Science fiction has been really important for me since I started writing as a kid. And it's something that I have never abandoned, reading or writing. But while I was doing this, it was really important also because it gave me balance, you know, because on one hand I was talking about something really concrete with really concrete sources with really concrete limits yeah. so it was good to me that on the side i started writing this thing that had no limit at all for me in terms of the language in terms of the topics in in in, in terms of the structure you know um so not so long after that uh i published it in spanish it's a collection of short story of short stories called uh, called diez planetas ten planets that uh are very likely uh, next year is coming out in english right. and it, it's a book that it, that makes it make, makes me really happy for for different reasons you know this is like a a, a, um, a trip back to to how I started writing, yeah. and I, I always insist that science fiction teaches any person who wants to write some really basic things about the craft and, and, and about the poetics of writing, which is that every time, even when you are trying to be realist, yeah. you have to assume the responsibility of creating a whole different world the way science fiction does, yeah. you know? that when we look at ourselves and when we look at our immediate um, surroundings with the same kind of curiosity that science fiction looks at the universe, yeah. then we are we are getting somewhere in, in poetic terms, you know. Yeah. And I think the more you you feed you, yourself with what different genres can teach you, the, the the richer would be the way you you approach reality, yeah. the way you approach your, yeah. your surroundings, you know, because you are not using just one single lens, exactly. but you are using different lenses that he, help you underscore different parts of, of yeah. the world. Thanks for uh, thanks for spending time chatting. Anyway, Yuri, it's brilliant. It's great to catch up with you. The last time I saw you was when I dropped you off, I think, at the airport in Bristol at a, at a kind of tiny oh. hotel that frankly looked like it was out of some of your more noir oriented writing, but in an English setting, it was a brutally sort of windy night. Uh, you'd done the okay. event with us and I just gave you a ride up to this. It was almost like a house, but it was a, it was, it was, it it was, was a, a house. house. It was like a sort of, uh, like a sort of bed and breakfast. And now yeah. that you say, well, 
we never talked after that, but actually, I don't know, you remember I had to be at the airport something like at 5 a.m.? Yeah, very early, yeah, yeah. I woke up like at 4, and I saw in the bathroom, like the teeth, someone's teeth there, you know, and it, it belonged to one of the people who owned the house. And so it was a really strange thing to wake up with you uh, in this strange place because I only spent there like four or five hours. You dropped yeah. me there around midnight. midnight yeah, so it was anyway. midnight and it was a and wild night. And, and it, it was, was almost, you know, the planes, the, the house was sort of here and yeah. the planes must have sort of been going right over the roof. Yeah, now that you said that, it was it was sort of a sinister place. It was. It was <laughs> yeah. It was. It was very funny. I took. I. Uh, it's not. It, a couple of times, my colleague Ed and I, who you met, have sort of talked about this place and saying that it was, you know, straight out of. If if only your writing was set in Bristol, this would be exactly the kind of place. Some of your, uh, I could see it straight from trans migration of bodies in 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 some kind of way. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. that was the last time I saw you. So it's good to it's good to catch up. So well, stay healthy. And you. Um, protect the books please note no good people were harmed in the making of this film though some were technologically challenged all books are available from www.mrbsemporium.com <laughs>